All right. Well, it's so good to be with everybody tonight all across this land. I trust that you will be blessed by the Word of God. We are here at our church. We do have our congregation here. But you are our congregation tonight all across America. You'll be listening in and watching, and I want you to be blessed. Our scripture reading tonight is going to come from the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And if you have your Bibles with you there where you are, in your home, living room, or wherever, and here in the church, you can turn there. And those that are with us here in the church, you can stand. And uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to get right into the Word of God. And as we pray tonight, I want you to pray with us wherever you are, and I want you to pray that God will open your heart to the Word of God. I was praying about this message today, and I have asked God to use this message to turn us in a direction that we ought to go, and I hope that we can all uh, be moved by God tonight. Our Father, as we come to you tonight, indeed we're grateful for this opportunity, not only to gather in this house of worship, to worship you together, but Lord, to be able to present the message that you have laid on my heart through the medium of the modern technology. Lord, as we're not able to meet in that convention hall there at Pigeon Forge, and we're having to do it a little differently, but we're still getting the message out across this land. And I'm asking you to bless every person that listens to this sermon, those that are in this house, our congregation here as well, as every person that will hear this message both now and in the days ahead as it'll be listened to later. We're asking you, God, to anoint your servant. We pray, God, that you'll open every heart to the Word of God. I believe, Lord, that if this message can be delivered in the way that you'd have it to be delivered and it can be received in the way that you'd have it to be received, that it can change the dynamics of our church world. And that's exactly what we need tonight. To God be glory and for and praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 16, we'll begin reading with verse 13. The scripture said, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Amen. God bless you now as we enter into the message that the Lord has placed upon my heart. I want to preach to you tonight on allowing God to move us from survival into revival. I believe, and you believe, and we all know that our world has drastically changed in the last few months. This change has been so dramatic and so powerful that it has thrown us as individuals, as families, as groups, as churches, as nations. It has literally put us into the mode of where we're just trying so often to survive. We're trying to stay away from the infection that has come into our land. And it has certainly affected the church of Almighty God. I dare say that I'm talking to anyone, anywhere in this great country, around the world tonight, that has not been affected and you have not done something to survive, to protect yourself from those things that are going on. 
There's never been so much hand sanitizer use in the history of mankind than there has in the last few months. Masks and all of these things, and they're good, and we thank God that we have those resources. But it has affected our church world. It has affected our worship. That's the reason that we're not in that convention hall in Pigeon Forge tonight, but we're doing it digital and virtual and online. It's because it has affected our church and it has affected our worship. And sometimes the church has just been trying to survive, just trying to get along. But I'm going to show you tonight by the Word of God that God delights to take His people from survival to revival. And I believe that's exactly what's about to happen to the church world and, and, and the day and hour in which you and I are living. Our text tonight is a very beautiful text. We're looking primarily uh, at verse 18 when Jesus said these words, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There are three things that we need to notice from this particular text. Number one, that Christ is the builder of this church. He is the architect. He's the architect. He is the carpenter. He is the erector. He is the builder of the church. I thank God for that. Because the Bible said, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. This church that I'm a part of, where we are gathered here tonight, your church, wherever you are, wherever you pastor, or wherever you attend, that's not your church. That's God's church. That's not your body. That's the body of Christ. And this verse lets us know, ladies and gentlemen, that the church was built on this rock. I will build my church. I wonder if there's anybody tonight that wants to give God just a little bit of praise because he is the builder of the church. Number two, this verse tells us in no uncertain terms that hell will attack the church. We should count it all joy, he said, when we fall into diverse temptation. But the devil, Jesus said, I build it, but the devil is going to try to tear it down. Satan is going to try to destroy that that I have built. Well, the Lord's lived up to his part. He has built a church. Now the devil has lived up to his part, and he's doing everything in his power to tear it down. He's just acting like the devil. That's all. Somebody said, why is this? Why is that? I said, because the devil is the devil, and it acts like nothing but the devil. But there's a third truth here. Jesus said, I'm going to build it. The devil going to try to tear it down but he says I'm not going to let him do that I'm not going to allow the gates of hell to prevail against this church I want to tell you tonight ladies and gentlemen that the word of God tells me that what Jesus starts Jesus will finish Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 12 says that we're not looking to man we're not looking to Washington. We're not looking to the capital city of our respective states. But he said, we are looking unto Jesus, who is the author. That means the beginning. He is the author, and he is the finisher of our faith. Can I say it like this? Jesus Christ wrote the first chapter of this church, and Jesus Christ is going to write the last chapter of this church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. No, Paul writing to the Philippian church in Philippians 1 and 6, he said we have this confidence. We have a confidence. We have an assurance. This is the way Paul said it. Being confident of this very thing 
that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. Now I want to give you a South Mississippi country boy interpretation of that scripture. That scripture is simply saying that no devil, no demonic power, nothing at all is going to ever put Jesus Christ out of business. He started this church by saving souls. He started this church by baptizing believers in the Holy Ghost. He started this church by healing the sick and performing miracles. And to God be the glory, he's going to end this church by saving the lost, baptizing the believer, healing the sick, and working miracles. But there's going to be one thing at the end that was not at the beginning. He's going to appear in the clouds of glory, and the trumpet's going to sound, and he's going to call his children home to God be glory. Now we're looking, you know, if we were in that convention hall tonight, I'd feel about an hour and a half sermon. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> but it's going to be hard to sit there that long and watch it, so we're going to condense it down. We get right into the message, the chase here. There are many, many stories in our Bible where God's people were in a survival situation. There was deliverance or death, one or the other. Either there had to be a divine deliverance, that God had to do something dramatic, God had to do something drastic, or else his people were going to die. His people were going to perish. But I say to you tonight, if you look carefully into the Word of God, God did never allow his people to die and be destroyed. God always devised a plan. There's several of those stories in the Word of God. There are many of them that we could talk about, but we're going to single out about two or three, and we're going to talk about them for just a little bit here. Then we're going to make application to my life and to yours. Of course, we talk often of Joseph down in the land of Egypt. It survived. It, it, it's have a miracle or we die. The land that's been in an awful, awful famine for a long, long time. But God brought a divine deliverance. Now I want to tell you something tonight as you listen carefully to me both here in this house and across our land as you're watching this this video at uh, this live whatever you want to call it dear Lord uh, God's deliverance came in the form of a man it came in the form of a person all of the stories in our Bible where we see his people going from survival to revival an angel did not come and cause it to happen no sir God never sent a cherubim or a seraphim but God always found him an individual and a man or a woman that he could use to take his church from survival to revival. You know the story of Joseph. We don't have to belabor that point. Joseph's a dead man. He's in the pit. They're going to kill him. He's in prison. And if God doesn't do something, he's going to die. But I can tell you this. His family is in a survival situation. They are literally starving starving to death in the land of Canaan. They live in the land of milk and honey, but they're starving to death. But let me tell you something. When the hunger pains get so strong, people begin to make a move. Across America tonight, we are getting hungry. I'm hungry for go back to a convention center. I'm hungry for the auditoriums that we stood in last year and preached the gospel. I'm hungry for the camp meetings and the conferences. And ladies and gentlemen, when that hunger gnaws at our heart, then we begin to move in the direction of an answer. And God used that man, Joseph, and instead of the family of Israel, the family of Jacob, 
dying in a survival situation. They are now eating to the full and they're living in the land of Goshen, the greatest part of the nation of, of Egypt. God has blessed them. They went from survival to revival. Can you say, somebody, somebody give God some praise tonight. We move on in our scripture. There are many others. We move on to that time. And we'll mention these two because one was Joseph the man. But then we come to the book of Esther. The children of Israel are literally under a death sentence. Haman has got the permission of the king to kill every Jew in his 127 provinces. But let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. They went from survival to revival. Because, and let me tell you, that revival bore the name of a lady by the name of Esther. Joseph, Esther, David, Moses. On and on we can go. But the, oh yes, God used Esther, sent her to the kingdom for such an hour as that. And she led her people from survival to revival. Hey, Amen. Yes, he did. God's response to his people in a time of trouble. How does God respond to his people in a time of trouble? Number one, he listens intently for their cry. He is like a father or a mother that in the midnight hour is listening for the cry of that child. You know, God's heart, God's ear is more a tender and attuned to the cry of his children than even these mothers and their cry to, to their own children. I can remember when our family, our boys were young in the middle of the night. My wife would kick the covers back, start getting out of the bed, but and, and I'd say, where are you going? She said, the baby just whimpered. The baby just made a noise. I say, are you sure? I didn't hear anything, but she did, and she was quick to respond. What's God's doing in heaven right now? What's our God doing right now? He's got his ear open and tuned toward the church and he's listening for that cry. And when he hears that cry, then he begins to move. Number one, God hears the cry of his people. You are praying. We are praying. And I want you to know that God is listening to every prayer. In fact, the word of God God said that somewhere in heaven that God bottles up our tears. Our prayers are not going unheard. No, sir, we may not see the results today, but our prayers are not in vain. They're not going unheard. I'm telling somebody tonight, the devil's trying to discourage you. The devil's trying to beat you down. The devil's telling you that God doesn't care. The devil's telling you that God's not listening. I'll tell you, that the devil is a liar for God has heard your prayer and he will answer that prayer in his time he hears the prayer of his children secondly when God's people cry out in a time of need God begins to devise a plan of deliverance I, oh listen carefully I said when God Here's a cry of his people that are in trouble. He begins to devise and to design a plan of deliverance. I speak to you with confidence tonight. I speak to you with a surety in my soul that because for the last few months we have prayed, we have sought God, I can tell you without fear of contradiction that somewhere in that glory world, in that war room of heaven, there is a plan for our deliverance that is right now being de devised. There is a plan that is being put together to bring us out of this mess and to set us free. 
you. God is advising a plan of our deliverance. And after God hears our prayer, and then God begins to devise a plan for our deliverance, then the third thing God does, he begins to look for a man. And he begins to look for a woman that he can use to bring to pass the design that he has made for our deliverance. The greatest architect in the world can call the greatest blueprints for the greatest structure. But until you find some hands that'll touch it, until you can find some eyes that'll see it, until you find a heart that's willing, it doesn't matter how great the plans that are drawn. There has to be somebody to make that plan a reality. And I'm telling you that God has a plan and God's looking across America to find some men and some women that he can use to bring that plan to the reality and to take us from survival in the revival. He's looking for that. Yes. That was Joseph. He found him a man. There was Moses. He found him a man. There was David. He found him a man. I want to slow down here for just a minute. We skipped right through Joseph quickly. We know that story. We didn't take a lot of time with Esther. We know her story. How that the Jews were not only saved, but the enemies of the Jews were destroyed. But I want to take just a few minutes as we look at how God used David to bring his nation from survival to revival. You know the story of David, the little shepherd boy. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, little boy, or out on that hillside. We know the story how that God sent Samuel to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse to anoint a king that Samuel picked out the one that he thought was the one. But God said, you look on the outward appearance, but I am looking on the heart. And so Samuel said to Jesse, is there not another son? And he said, but there is one. But then he began to make excuses about the one that was left. In other words, if we just put it in common everyday language, when Samuel said, to Jesse, is there not another son? He said, yes, sir. There's one more. But in reality, what he was saying is he's not king material. He's not the kind of person that you're looking for. He's just a little shepherd boy. He just goes down and watches the sheep. He was a man, a child, a youth that not even his father thought that God could use him. Not even his father thought that he was qualified. Not even his father believed that he possessed any talent, any strength, or any ability to become the leader of the people of God. Somebody hear me tonight. You listen to this preacher as I preach to you from this pulpit. I want you to tune out all of the voices that tell you you're no good. They tell you you don't talk good enough. They tell you you sing off key. They tell you you sermons are not one, two, three, and ABC. They tell you you're not good enough. God doesn't listen to that because God is not looking for somebody that can preach a well-constructed sermon or somebody that can sing every note and every key. He's just looking for a heart that says, I will be what you want me to be. Somewhere I'm talking to somebody tonight. God wants your heart. exactly what God wants. But Samuel said, you may look at it that way, but I'm going to look through the eyes of God. You go get that boy and that little strapling ruddy, redhead probably, red face, that's what the word ruddy means, walked up before David. Oh, it was Samuel. David walked up before Samuel. God said, that's my man because down inside that little strapling boy, I see a heart. I see a heart. 
I see a heart that loves me. I see a heart that wants me. I see a heart that's committed and surrendered. And Samuel poured that oil upon the head of that young man. I pray tonight, my God, as you sit in your homes or wherever you are and you're listening and you're watching this sermon, I'm praying tonight that God is looking down into some people's lives and he's seeing a heart that he says, I can use. I can take care of the talent. I can I can take care of the ability. I can take care of the mechanics. I can take care of the mechanics of preaching if I can just find the heart. I can take care of the mechanics of singing. I can take care of the mechanics of teaching a Sunday school class if I can just find the heart. God is looking at some hearts tonight. My prayer to God is this. As God looks in the living rooms, wherever you are all across America and around the world. My prayer is that God is finding some hearts and he's about to pour the oil, the oil of fresh anointing into some lives. Somebody feels it now. Even now, somebody feels tears welling up in your eyes. Even now, the palm of somebody's hand are beginning to sweat. Even now, somebody's heart is beginning to beat fast in your bosom because God has found in you a heart that he says, I can anoint. I can anoint that. My God, my God, somebody right where you are, you ought to lift your hand and say, pour it on me, God. Pour that all right here in this building, wherever you are, across America and around the world. God, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm willing to accept it. Let me tell you about that boy, David. That boy, David, you say, well, preacher, Israel's not in a survival situation. No, but they're going to be. They're going to be because now there's war. They're in war. Do you know we're in war? Do you know? there is a warfare going on in our world and in our nation. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, as you listen to me tonight, that the church has become under attack and the spiritual Philistines have come against the people of God. You know why? Just like they did in the days of David. They set the battle in array. They ran their champion out on top of that hill and said, if I win, you're going to serve me. If I I win. You're going to serve us. Listen to me. I didn't come here to get too political, but I'm talking about from survival to revival. There is an element in this country that they win. They want the church to become subservient to them. They want the church to worship them, to preach what they say we can preach, to teach what they say we can teach. But I've got news to them, ladies and gentlemen. They may put us in survival mode, but our God will pull us out of survival and put us in the revival. So Jesse tells David, he says, go down to the battle. Check on your brothers. You know the story. David gets down to the battle and Goliath roars out from the top of that hill. Nine and a half, ten foot high. Send me a man to fight. David looked around. He looked at his big, bad soldier brothers. Surely they'll go and they'll fight. But they didn't go. They ran. They hid. They're afraid. Oh, my. They're afraid of that enemy. David said, somebody's got to fight this man. David said, is there not a cause? Now, let me just preach to you for just a minute here. Let me just tell you something. David has killed a lion. David has killed a bear. You know why? Because he's a shepherd. That's exactly right. His sheep have been attacked, and he has come to fight for his sheep. I've been a pastor for better than 50 years. I have fought for my sheep. I've fought the lions. I have fought the bears. I have prayed. 
night, through the wee hours of the night, because one of my little lambs have been attacked by hell. I've won a lot of those battles. I'm afraid I've lost more than I wish I had because I can't control the spirit of a man. But when David looked at Goliath, he said, this time we're not fighting to save a lamb. We're fighting to save a nation. When I was on the, in the pasture and a lion came and I killed him and I took the, that lamb wounded and bleeding out of that lamb, lion's mouth, I doctored it. I, I tended to it. I took care of it till it got well. My father was pleased with me because I killed a lion that wanted to destroy his lamb. God bless you, pastors. God bless you for fighting the lions and fighting the bears and for saving the sheep. But now, if, if that lion wins, all we've lost is one sheep. If that bear wins, all we've lost is one lamb, and that's too many. But David knew this. Now we're in survival situation because if that man on that hill wins, then we have lost our nation. We have lost everything. It's not just a sheep, pastor, Sunday school teacher, deacon board, whoever you are. I want you to know something tonight. We're not just fighting to build a Sunday school. We are fighting to save a nation. We are fighting to save a culture. We are fighting to save. We might have lost a few battles with the lions and had a few people to leave our churches, but this is different. This is survival. If that giant wins, we lose the nation. We lose the culture. If that giant wins, we don't lose a lamb. We lose it all. I wonder, can you see that picture tonight? Can you see that picture unfolding in America? Can you? Is it not pretty plain that we have thought? Oh, I remember in the early days of my ministry. Back in the late 1960s when I was a kid, I was still a kid at heart. And I was preaching, man, you could take a water gun and fight hell. All in the world we had to preach against was gossiping and snuff dipping. But you listen carefully. It's not that way tonight. We're dealing with forces whose intent is to destroy us, to shut the doors of our churches, to turn out the lights. But God said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. The Goliaths shall not prevail. The Pharaohs shall not prevail. The Hasseriuses shall not prevail because I found the Joseph, I found the Moses, I found an Esther, and I found a David. Yes, what's God doing now? He's a looking for that man. He's looking for that woman that says, this is my church. This is my life. This is my God. This is my family. And you will take it over my dead body. David recognized the consequences of a victorious Goliath. I said David recognized the consequence of a victorious Goliath. Do we recognize the consequence of a victorious system that wants to tax our churches unless we stop preaching against abortion? Do we recognize the consequences of a church, of a world that wants to stop us from preaching the Word of God and saying it's wrong, it's wrong for a man to marry a woman, or a man to marry a man, a man's supposed to marry a woman? Do we recognize the consequences of that? What is the consequence of that? The consequence is the nuclear family's gone. There'll be no more mom and pop 
and boys and girls and babies and sons and daughters and grandchildren around the family table at Thanksgiving. Do we realize, ladies and gentlemen, what's going on? I know, I know in this epidemic that we're in, I know we're not supposed to shake hands. We're not to hug one another's necks. Understand that. But ladies and gentlemen, we, we, we must do that. We must until this thing passes. But you know what this world is hoping? They're hoping that that love and that closeness that we have will die and that we'll never come back to the place that we love and prefer our brother more than we do ourselves. But David recognized the consequences. I got a word for you, Mr. Goliath. You've got a lot of people scared. You've got a lot of people afraid. But God found one heart that does not fear the Goliaths of this world. Somewhere in the confines of your living room, I want you to raise your hand and say, devil, you've got some shaking in the boots. You've got some scared to death. You've got some having nightmares. But I want you to know, Mr. Devil, leaning back in this lazy boy recliner, here is one heart that's not afraid to stand up for what's right and truth. God can take and use me. We face those Goliaths. An anti-Christ spirit, an anti-Bible spirit, an anti-church spirit, and all of these. But dear friend, Israel went from survival to revival when David came walking down that hill with Goliath's head in his hand. Mr. Devil, you're going to lose again. Satan, you're going to lose again. Because God's looking and God's going to find some more Davids. And they're going to cut off some more Goliath's heads. Are you listening carefully? Hear me tonight. God had David in the right place at the right time. My dear brother, my dear sister, you were not born out of season. As much as you can read the history of the church and say, I wish I'd have lived 50 years ago or 100 years ago and could have been a part of that culture. I guess we all feel that way at times. But ladies and gentlemen, your mother did not birth you by accident. God had a hand in that. God birthed you into this world for this hour. You are the person. God, God does not want old Roberts for this hour. God wants Andy Stringfella for this hour. God wants you for this hour. Ladies and gentlemen, we are standing on the brink of revival because God is going to take us there. David knew there was a cause. There is a cause. We know that. Our religious freedom is a cause. Our cause, our ability to preach biblical truth is a call. Our, our cause, our moral beliefs and the morality of our nation is a cause. Our God will deliver us from the threat of every modern day Goliath that threatens the existence of our church. If you believe it, say amen. <laughs> Albert Einstein summed it up like this. Albert Einstein said the world is a dangerous place not because of those who do evil but because of those that look upon evil and do nothing about it. Can I, pre can I take that statement of Einstein and make it fit our present hour? What he's saying is the world is a dangerous place right now for the people of God and the church of God. But the danger that we face is not those that do evil and speak evil, but our danger is those that see evil and look upon it and do absolutely nothing about it. What can I do, preacher? What can I do? What can you do? You say, I don't, I don't have any power. I don't have any power at all. Do you believe there's power in the blood? Or are you covered in the blood? Don't tell me that you don't have power. Do you believe that you receive power after the Holy Ghost has come on you? The Holy Ghost has come on you, right? 
don't tell me that you don't have power. Now don't 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 jump off the train. I'm about to make a point here. I'm not being facetious. I'm just I'm just making a point. Some of you say, but I don't have money. I don't have talent. I don't have any, any of this. Listen, I was told, and I don't necessarily believe it. I think somebody just made a lot of money off of a phony, funny old song. But I was told that a squirrel took a church from survival to revival in Pascagoula, Mississippi. heard that <laughs> don't fall out with me now I'm not, I'm not through I'm just I'm just making a point that guy <laughs> you know said <laughs> the day the squirrel went to church that's right said they went from survival to revival when the squirrel went to church let me tell you something I said that I'm not trying to be funny I said it to make a point I don't think that happened. I do think if a squirrel got loose in this church and ran up somebody's britches leg, it started commotion. It might not be revival. But if God could use a squirrel, why can't God use you? Why can't God use me? Why can't God use us? Though church, church history many times was in a state of survival. In the 1500s, the church was going to die. Because the Pope and those in authority said that you had to do good works and pay money to have your sins forgiven. And the world's going to go to hell. And the church going to die because you got to pay money and do good works to be forgiven of sin but God found a man by the name of Martin Luther and he said Martin Luther you tell him that my book said the just shall live by faith and a reformation was started 200 years later man now has decided that all they've got to do is believe they're saved by grace through faith Therefore, they can live a life of sin. And God needed the church to know something about a sanctified lifestyle. And so he found two men by the name of John and Charles Wesley that went out preaching, yes, the you're saved by grace through faith, but then you've got to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. And God brings his church from survival to revival. And then, ladies and gentlemen, men now, they believe that they can be they're saved by grace but they've got to walk right spent white and all that kind of stuff or they're going to go to hell I believe a lot of that myself but then he said we need power to live right we need power to overcome and he raised up men like Charles Parham William Seymour Bishop Charles Mason A.J. Tomlinson and a world of others that said ladies and gentlemen we can be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire and we can speak with other tongues as the Lord gives the utterance. Then as that's restored, the Martin Luther said, by grace, saved by grace through faith. John Wesley said, after that sanctification, these men said, after that, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And then he said, you know what I want to do? I want to restore miracles. And I want to restore healings. And I want to restore signs and wonders. And he raised up men like John Alexander Dowie. Raymond T. Ritchie, F. F. Bosworth, and others, and they reintroduced divine healing to the church. Now, what's happened? God said, I'll tell you what I want to do now. I want to introduce an overcoming, victorious, hell shaking, devil killing spirit back into my church. Martin Luther's been dead 1,500 years. God's not going to raise him up. John Wesley's been dead 1,300 years. God's not going to raise him up. 
path got off a little there. Bishop Mason, these men have been dead 100 years. God's not going to raise them up. Dowie, Bosworth, they've been dead 100 years. God's not going to raise them up. Ladies and gentlemen, if God had wanted Martin Luther in 2020, he'd have saved him to now. God wanted John Wesley in 2020, he'd have saved him to now. God wanted Bishop Mason in 2020, he'd have saved him to now. But he didn't. He didn't. Who will it be this time? that God will use to take his church from survival to revival. Will it be Andy Stringfellow? Will it be Greg Atkins? Will it be Anthony Wynn? Will it be Darrell Turner? Will it be Scott Morris? Will it be Marshall Hadcock? Will it be Jerry Kalinske? Will it be Melvin Sanchez? Will it be Mark? Will it be Jeff Smith? Or Roger Luke? Or Gene Shepard? Or D.R. Sartridge? Or Tim Colley? Or will it be one of us here? I don't know. I just know. God's going to find somebody. So I close. I hear the voice of God saying, who will go? And whom shall I send? And somewhere I hear it echoing in my spirit. Somebody is saying, here am I, Lord. Send me. I'll pray. I'll fast. I'll stand. Will it be a Bob McBride? A Joey McCree? A Jerry Thompson? A Jason Moore? Will it be a Skyler Smith? A Mona Anderson? Here am I, Lord. Send me. When God finds his man, his men, and his women, we're going from survival to revival. You listen to this preacher as Tim begins to play on the piano. We're about to see the greatest revival that we've ever seen because God is beginning to raise up men and women for the glory of God. I'm going to ask the congregation here to stand. And the song that Tim's about to sing is going to be our prayer right here in our sanctuary. And I want you to make it your prayer wherever you are tonight. I want you to know I love you. God bless you. I'm expecting good news from your field of labor. Sing this song with Tim. Let this be your prayer tonight. God bless you and good night. Jesus, use me. And oh, Lord, don't refuse me. Surely there's the work that I can do. And even though it's humble, Lord, help my will to crumble. Though the cost is great, I'll work for you. Jesus, use me and oh, Lord, don't refuse. Oh.
help my will to crumble Though the cost is great, I'll work for you